Minnesota Department of Human Services, Children's Mental Health, ADHD, Susan Dannon, LICSWRPT, Minnesota Child Welfare Training System. Hello and welcome to the Children's Mental Health ADHD presentation through the Minnesota Child Welfare System. Uh, my name is Susan Dannon and we will get started with the ADHD presentation now. So the first thing that I wanted to cover is just breaking down what ADHD is. So ADHD means that individuals have trouble with their attention, which means their ability to sustain mental focus. The deficit part means that they are missing that ability. And the hyperactivity is about having difficulty slowing down. And disorder just means a disruption of functioning. So for individuals with ADHD, their everyday functioning is impacted by their inability to sustain mental focus and control excess body activity. It's estimated that 9% of school-aged children and 4% of adults have ADHD. ADHD is considered a brain-based disorder where there are either chemical imbalances in the brain or damage to the brain system that has caused these symptoms. The most common cause of ADHD is heredity. Over 25% of first degree relatives of the families of ADHD children also had ADHD, whereas the rate was only about 5% in each of the control groups. And that was a study by Bitterman back in 1990. So if a parent has ADHD, the child has more than a 50% chance of having it. And if an older sibling has it, the child has more than a 30% chance. In some cases, there are children who, because of damage to the brain system through toxins, birth trauma, or other injury, may also develop ADHD symptoms. For these children, their symptoms may not be triggered by chemical imbalances, but by actual physical damage to the brain, which makes this disorder more complex and difficult to treat with typical ADHD medications and interventions. Today, we'll focus most of our presentation on children with chemical her and heredity ADHD, since this is the most common form of the disorder. Uh, the other thing that the studies have shown is that there are some things that do not cause ADHD. So the factors that are not conclusive are sugar, bad parenting, electronics, video games, and watching TV. So a little bit about behavior versus biology and mental health. In mental health, we often talk about behavioral issues, which are chosen behaviors that have a purpose. And those behaviors are to get a need met. So those behavioral issues in mental health, the child may be aware or unaware of the purpose of their behavior. But regardless of their awareness, the emotions and behaviors are impacted by the child's internal thoughts and feelings due to their beliefs about themselves, others in the world, and how they need to act in order to get those needs met. So in those cases, with therapy support and time, the child is able to discover more functional ways to get their needs met. With mental health behaviors, this is where the child has increased difficulty controlling their behavior despite their best effort due to biological factors. So in this case, that the chemical imbalances in the brain, neurological issues, or damage to brain development because of trauma, they may need more intensive support and or they may need to accept that the child may not be able to change, and so the environment has to change to support these children. With both of this, we need to be able to set appropriate expectations based on the child's mental health needs. So ADHD is considered a biological trigger for the mental health symptoms. And so the child most often is not acting out on purpose. So the focus is on creating a structured environment to help the child be successful despite their difficulties. That being said, your foster child with ADHD may have other mental health issues where they are also choosing a behavior to get a need met. So it's important to figure out what is the appropriate expectations for the child and what they can and what they can't control. So it is believed that ADHD is for life. 
Um, so this slide is about Adam Levin, who has been an advocate for ADHD after finding out that he had adult ADHD. Um, so as he got older, he thought that his ADHD would go away, and then he realized eventually that it was something that was still there. So it is believed that individuals whose ADHD is triggered by chemical imbalances in the brain are not able to grow out of the ADHD. However, adults may be less impacted by their ADHD as they learn to manage their symptoms, or they pursue careers that are active and stimulating to them, and thus they don't require as much sustained mental focus. There is some evidence that there are some children who are born with thinner brain tissue around the brain area that impacts the focus. And for these children, as they age, the brain tissue thickens and they are not as impacted by their ADHD as they get older. However, this is a small percentage of the population. So children who suffer from ADHD symptoms due to some type of physical injury to the brain will also normally sustain lifetime symptoms. And again, this will be a more complicated type of ADHD and treatment for them. So a little bit about culture and mental health. Cultural differences do impact how we assess, cope with, and treat behaviors and symptoms in mental health. So looking at how problematic or accepted is a behavior or symptom in the child's community, faith, family, and or social group becomes important. So mental health professionals should take cultural issues under consideration and ask questions related to the context of culture with mental health symptoms, including ethnicity, family, expectations and values, as well as community and religious beliefs and values before determining a diagnosis. So if you are aware of a cultural belief or norm that the professional may be unaware of with your foster child, please let them know this. So for instance, especially with ADHD, one of the symptoms is that the child runs about and climbs when, is it, when it's expected to be seated. But by whose definition and what circumstances is this under? Does the child's culture expect children to be very physically active or is there an expectation that the child be very obedient and keep their bodies under control? Is there a different expectation in school about the child's ability to focus as compared to the child's family and community? The more information a clinician has about the child's background, the better they will be able to determine the impact on the child's functioning and know whether or not this is truly ADHD. So just a little bit about the DSM. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it is the way that individuals in the mental health field give diagnoses. So in it, there is a list of symptoms to help determine the diagnosis. So these diagnoses are based on research and they are categorized based on Western medical practices, which also can be part of where the cultural piece comes in. So with all of the diagnoses, the individual needs to meet a minimum number of symptoms to be given a specific diagnosis as described in the DSM. So with ADHD, it is considered a neurodevelopmental disorder in the DSM. So neurodevelopmental means that there is a belief the ADHD is a disorder that is triggered by issues related to the development of the brain, and it is not considered a behavioral issue. So for instance, in the DSM, there is a list of groupings referred to as disruptive behavior disorders, which would be things like oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder, where the child appears to be choosing to be disruptive. In the case of ADHD, it is believed that this is a neurodevelopmental disorder, that it is brain-based, and that the child is not choosing these behaviors. So with this kind of brain-based disorder, what the belief is is that people with ADHD have less activity in areas of the brain that control attention. The neurotransmitters are those parts of the brain that help send messages between the nerve cells. So issues with neurotransmitters are thought to trigger the majority of the ADHD symptoms. So the two main neurotransmitters that are talked about as far as impacting ADHD are dopamine 
and dopamine enhances brain signals. It improves attention, focus, on-task behaviors, and on-task thinking. Neuropronephrine is the other one, which is a neurotransmitter that dampens noise and increases the ability to think and reason. So according to the research, both dopamine levels and neuropronephrine levels are understimulated in the ADHD brain, meaning there is not enough of them in the brain as compared to the average individual. So in this PET scan, you can see the dopamine transmitters. So on one side is the control subject and on the other side is the ADHD subject. So what the PET scans revealed is that ADHD subjects had significantly fewer dopamine transmitters than the control subjects. So scores of inattention were on average five times greater for ADHD subjects than for the control subjects. So since do dopamine enhances brain signals that improve attention, focus, and on-task behaviors and on-task thinking, this is where the ADHD brain struggles. So basically what the issue is is that individuals whose brains are understimulated are seeking out outside stimulation for their brain to compensate for the brain not being stimulated enough. So they are trying to take in extra stimulation through physical activity, the moving around excessively, or mental activity, such as focusing on multiple things at one time. So even though it appears that these individuals are very hyperactive and inattentive, um, what's really happening is that their brain is not stimulated enough. And because they are trying to focus on so many things, they struggle with sustaining focus on a single point. So this can be somewhat confusing because what we are observing is excess activity levels, but what the problem is is that there are actually low activity levels in the brain. So one thing to kind of remember with all of this is that if an ADHD child is doing something that is novel, interesting, or stimulating to them, they will be able to stay more focused because the experience is giving them extra stimulation to the brain. So that's why some ADHD children can stay focused for long periods of time and even over-focus when playing video games, building with Legos, and even for some kids reading because their brain is being stimulated by those activities that they enjoy and that they find interesting. So the less stimulating activity is for a child, the more their ADHD will manifest itself. So subjects that they don't like in school, going to a grocery store, or attending a concert or a sporting event that they aren't interested in, you'll notice more of the attention behaviors. And those will give you an idea of what things they struggle with and can help you prepare the child for those activities ahead of time. So we're going to go to a video now to just give you some idea of what ADHD looks like in a practical sense. What was I doing? Hey bud, what's going on? I'm starting a restaurant. Only using apple-based ingredients. I'm gonna call it apple. Huh. Keys. Babe, do you know where my keys are? Phone, phone, phone. Wallet. Do you see my wallet? Found the keys. I am thirsty. Yeah, now I gotta pee. Okay, well, it's today garbage day. The thing that's tomorrow, the thing that's today. No, it's today. I didn't forget. Didn't forget. Nope, didn't forget.
like, I can't right now. Okay. Sometimes I think like I have ADHD because I don't like want to do homework. It's not exactly like that. Found my phone. So I hope that you enjoyed that video of just some practical examples of even adults who have ADHD. So we're going to move on to the next slide now. Um, and talk about the different types of ADHD. So in the DSM-5, there are listed three types of ADHD. So there's the primarily inattentive, which means the ADHD symptoms show up mostly as difficulty staying mentally focused. There's the primarily hyperactive, where the ADHD symptoms mostly show up as difficulty with excessive motor activity and acting impulsively without thinking. And then mixed inattentive and hyperactive is the most common type. And this is where there's mostly an equal mix of inattention and hyperactivity. So one of the struggles, especially with the inattentive ADHD, is that because it has less physical symptoms, kids often aren't diagnosed until school requires more focus and more self-reliance. And so this can often be difficult on kids' self-esteem. So with the diagnosing, the individuals need to display at least six out of nine inattentive and or hyperactive impulsive symptoms to be given that diagnosis. So the first one that we're going to look at is the ADHD inattentive type. So some people say that I have ADHD, but I don't think, look, there's a squirrel. That is the ADHD child. So oftentimes we'll jokingly refer to this with the kids as a squirrel brain. So the nine inattentive symptoms that are often seen with children and adults as well with inattentive ADHD is that they fail to give close attention and make careless mistakes. So they tend to overlook or miss details and their work tends to be very inaccurate. The second one is they have difficulty sustaining attention in tasks and activities. So they have difficulty remaining focused on the things that they are doing. The next one is that they don't seem to listen when spoken to. So their mind seems to be somewhere else, even in the absence of any obvious distractions. They don't follow through on instructions and they fail to finish homework, chores, or work. So this is their difficulty with follow through. They will start tasks and then quickly lose focus and or they're easily sidetracked once they get started. So they also will have difficulty organizing tasks and activities. So they will have difficulty man managing sequential tasks. They'll also have difficulty keeping materials and belongings in orders they will oftentimes be described as messy and disorganized. Teachers and others will talk about the fact that they have poor time management and that they fail to meet deadlines. The other thing is, is that they are often reluctant to engage in tasks and activities that required sustained mental effort. And what this means is that they have a hard time engaging and starting things and when they're trying to prepare homework and for older adolescents or adults, it may also be things like preparing reports, completing forms, or reviewing lengthy papers. The other thing is, is that they will lose things frequently, and especially things that are necessary for their tasks and activities. So they will often misplace school materials, pencils, books, tools, wallets, keys, paperwork, eyeglasses, cell phones. They will also be easily distracted by external stimulus. So for older adults and adolescents, this may also be that they will have intrusive thoughts that will suddenly come up. Um, sometimes this is talked about with individuals who are kind of daydreaming. 
And so they will actually get distracted by things within their own mind, along with getting distracted by hearing things and seeing things around them. And then the last inattentive symptom is being forgetful in daily activities. And so they will often forget to do chores, running errands, uh, for older adolescents and adults, returning phone calls, paying bills, keeping appointments can all become problematic for them. So the other type of ADHD is the hyperactive and impulsive. So this is the inability to slow down and control actions within the body. So the thing that we see with these type of children and even adults is that they are hyperactive and impulsive. So these are the nine symptoms that are talked about in the DSM for individuals with the hyperactive impulsive symptoms. So the first one is that they tend to fidget with their hands or squirm in their seat. And what this means is that the individual leaves his or her place in the classroom in the office or other workplace or other situations that require them to stay in place. And so they're often getting up and moving around, which leads into the next part, which is leaving the seat when being seated is expected. Um, with adults and adolescents, this be, may kind of just be more of their restlessness and falls into the fidgeting and squirming as well. The other one is the one that I mentioned earlier, which is runs about or climbs when, where it is inappropriate. So this running about and climbing excessively is that the individual is unable to be comfortable sitting still for extended periods of time, such as in restaurants, meetings, and they may be experienced by others as being restless or difficult to keep up with because they have so much activity and they can't keep still for very long. Which also ties into being unable to play or engage in activities quietly. So with ADHD children, they will make a lot of external noises with their body. They'll be drumming on tables to the point that is disruptive to others. And the child or the adult is often unaware of the fact that this is bothering other individuals. So the other piece of that is that they are always on the go as if driven by a motor. So with this, they will constantly be moving around, very, very active. It's where sometimes uh, foster parents will talk about being very worn out by their ADHD foster children because they're constantly on the go. The other thing is that they do talk excessively. So oftentimes they will complete other people's sentences, they have difficulties waiting for their turn in conversations, and so that's where the blurting out answers comes in. So they may answer questions before they are completed. They may interrupt the teacher while she is trying to ask questions of other students. And that they'll often be talked about as having a difficulty waiting their turn and raising their hand to talk. And so they do have difficulty waiting their turn. So they will intrude upon others by interrupting them, by butting in on things, which ties into that piece about interrupting or intruding. So the butting into conversations, other people's games or activities. They also may start using other people's things without asking or receiving permission. With adults and adolescents, this may look more like intruding into or taking over what others are doing. And so all of this leads to them having an appearance of being very impatient, having a difficult time waiting. Waiting in line is usually extremely difficult for ADHD kids. So as I mentioned earlier, since inattentive ADHD has less physical symptoms, it does often go unnoticed until school requires more focus and self-reliance. And females are more likely to have diagnosed inattentive ADHD, and therefore they are kids who tend to be diagnosed at older ages. 
So this can be really hard on kids' self-esteem, especially if the ADHD isn't caught until adolescence. And females are more likely to be diagnosed with the inattentive ADHD and at older ages, and so they often will also have more of a struggle with the self-esteem and will often have depressive symptoms along with their ADHD. So one of the things that can be helpful with ADHD is that because the chemical imbalances in the brain trigger the ADHD symptoms, there are some psychiatric medications that can be very effective in treating these symptoms. So psychiatric medications can have some significant side effects if they are not taken as directed. So you want to make sure that you know what those side effects are, that you're giving the medication exactly, and you also want to make sure that you have a lockbox for the medication. And it should be noted that most ADHD medications are considered a controlled substance, and so they do need to be monitored more closely than some other psychiatric medication. So if you do see any side effects that are of concern, you do want to make sure that you call right away about those side effects. With the lockbox, the reason for that is that it's a safety measure for the family members and for your own peace of mind. Because one of the things with the ADHD medications being a controlled substance is that unfortunately ADHD medications, especially the stimulants, um, do have a high market value when they are sold and so they are frequently abused. Um, so normally you will only be given 30 days at a time on these medications and then we'll need to get a new script if the medication is lost because these medications are closely monitored. So what the medications do is that they are stimulant medications most of the time. So these stimulant medications help increase stimulation to the brain, and then once the brain is stimulated, then the individual can improve their focus and decrease their hyperactivity. And one of the wonderful things is, is that stimulant medications do work for 70 to 80% of people who have diagnosed ADHD. So the types of stimulants that are on the market are either short acting, which are four to six hours in length as far as how long the medication lasts. The long acting medications are eight to 12 hours, which include things like Adderall, Vyvanse, Ritalin, Concerta, and Focalin. Non-stimulant medications are medications that take longer to start working in the system so these are medications like Stratera and Intunib. Um, so the difficulty with those medications is it does take some time for them to start working in the system, whereas with the stimulants, they start working within 15 to 20 minutes. The downside with the stimulants is that they are out of the system on a daily basis, whereas the non-stimulants will stay in the system pretty much 24-7. Some of the lesser used medications for ADHD include antidepressants and blood pressure medications, such as clonidine. Um, children who suffer ADHD symptoms due to some type of physical injury to the brain normally will not respond as well to ADHD stimulant medications, and this is often the individuals who will end up being put on the antidepressants or the blood pressure medications to help control their ADHD symptoms. So this is another uh, brain scan that is comparing a brain that is on Adderall and a brain without Adderall. So Adderall is a stimulant medication that is frequently prescribed for ADHD. And so it stimulates the brain so the mind and body can focus on what they need to focus on. So if you look at the brain scan of this individual who has been diagnosed with ADHD and you look at their brain without the Adderall, what you'll see is a lot of the yellow and the green area. Those are the areas that are understimulated, where that dopamine and the neuropinephrine is not stimulating the brain as enough. So 
why stimulant medications work is they stimulate the brain so the body and mind can focus. So a stimulant for a non-ADHD person will actually cause a person to be hyperactive. But in an ADHD individual, it actually has the opposite effect. So it is a really true physical effect. It's not just them acting out. So just as a reminder, the less stimulating an activity is for a child, the more their ADHD will manifest itself. So medications are most helpful when there's a need for sustained focus, such as in school, work activities, or any type of activity where they need to sit and focus for a, a sustained period of time. And this is where it can get difficult sometimes in school settings, is that ADHD children a lot of times will have very unusual patterns with their schooling. So in classes where they are interesting, stimulating, they are going to be more able to focus. And in those classes where they are not as interested in them, where there's more paperwork, where more sustained focus is needed, then they're going to have a harder time in those classes. And so even though a child may have an average IQ and can do well in any class that they're in, they will struggle more in those classes where they are bored, where they're having a hard time being engaged. So one of the things with ADHD kids is the more classes that they can have where they're engaged, where they're active, where they're being stimulated, the better that they're going to do. The other thing to remember is most ADHD medications are out of the system in 8 to 12 hours. So unfortunately for most foster parents, that means that the morning time and the evening time is when kids struggle the most at home because they will take the medication in the morning. It will take about 15 to 20 minutes to kick in. You're dropping them off at school. You pick them up after school and their meds are starting to wear off. So that's where it becomes important to have structure and keep these kids active and have engaging morning and evening routines to help them be successful when the medications are not there to support them. So with all of that, ADHD kids really need to have patient adults in their life. They need consistency and repetition. So youth with ADHD need you to be patient because of their tendency to forget things. You need to remember that they're not purposely forgetting those things, but what is happening is that they are trying to comply with directions and then forget what they're supposed to be doing, or they become distracted and then forget what they were supposed to do. So if you do have consistency and routine where there is repetition, that will help them remember things. And so doing the same thing over and over again and having that routine is really important for ADHD kids. So the things that you really want to do is create fun, energetic, active ways for them to accomplish chores, work, and those type of things. And it will be to your advantage, especially in the morning and evening routines, to have that energy and that engagement with them so that they don't get off track with what they're doing. So some of the things that you can do for them as far as structure goes is the routines and rituals. So focus on simple and predictable routines for them. One of the ways to do this is by posting uh, pictures or using a voice recorder so that they can listen to the routines. So routines are really good for homework, morning routines, bedtime routines, and what you really want to do with these, as you can see in the example, is list out what to do first, second. So it can be things like lay out your clothes for the next morning, make sure your backpack is in the same place each night, and have them be able to check off those lists. And like I said, one of the other options is to actually do some type of voice recording. One of the things that can be nice is actually to have the child record their own voice in giving out what the routine is. Some children that I've had have also done things like 
now I'm going to brush my teeth for two minutes and then they'll have a song on the recording that they can brush their teeth to. And so that's a nice way for them to kind of time those things and remember what's expected and how long they should be doing those things. So then once the music ends, they know that they're supposed to move on to the next subject. The other thing to do with that is to put like a timer or a bell into the recording to help with that. So talking about timers and bells, clocks and timers can also be a really wonderful way to set up routines for kids. And so having an old fashioned timer with a ticking noise and a bell also helps give them really a good auditory reminder. So with that, making sure that they've got a transition time with the clocks and giving them plenty of warning of when they need to move on to the next object can be really important as well. Um, the other way to use the clocks and timers is during those times like the brushing the teeth or getting ready for bed, taking a bath even, setting the timer for how many minutes are expected for them to do that activity. And then having that auditory ticking gives them an auditory reminder of what they should be doing. And then when the alarm goes off, they know it's time for them to stop and move into the next space. So the other thing that can be really important for kids, especially when they are working on homework, is to create a quiet space for them. So it's good to reduce stimulation and at the same time giving them fidgets and things that will help them get some sensory input while they are trying to focus. One of the handouts that should be attached for you is homework help creating a homework space. And that's through the National Resource Center on ADHD, which is a program of CHAD. Um, so that is something that you may want to go back and reference that will have some more information in it as regarding to creating that homework space for kids. But some of the things is to have that sensory input for them, like I said. So it can be things to squeeze in their hand, um, we've also sometimes for kids created a frame with puffy glue and you can kind of see the picture of that on the slide. So the idea with that is that they put their work inside that frame so that it gives them a frame of reference for their eyes to focus on. And by doing that also, they have the stimulation of the puffy paint or anything else that you want to put around the edge of that frame that they can touch, they can look at. So it's giving some, them some extra visual stimulation as well as sensory input. Also with ADHD kids, when they're studying, you want to make sure that they have frequent breaks. And when they have those breaks, make sure that you're timing them so that they don't get too off task and they remember to come back. So this can be another place where using a timer can be especially useful. Also during those breaks is make sure that they're doing something active because that's going to help with that stimulation piece. Um, some of the other things that you can do that's in the picture is having a rubber band that wraps around the outside legs of the desks um, so that they have a place to put their feet and they can have that stimulation of bouncing their feet up and down off of the band. Balance balls to sit on and or standing desks can be really useful for kids with ADHD because again, it's allowing them to have some stimulation without being overly distracting. Letting them think out loud is another way to help them. So if they're auditorily talking through what they are doing, that will help with the auditory stimulation and it will also help them remember things better. The other thing to do with kids when they're studying who have ADHD is having them act out or draw out what they're studying. So again, that they're studying in a more active, stimulating manner. Kids with ADHD do also quickly forget things because of distractions, or they will only hear the last direction that is given. So that is where we also want to keep directions short and sweet. So that means giving a one or two step direction, having them repeat the direction, and if necessary, you can also have them write down the direction. So having them repeat it will give them that auditory cue 
And it also takes more neural networks to write something down than when you say it. So having them physically write down the direction will have, help them with the memory. So if you feel like that's necessary, do have them write down directions or things that you're expecting them to do so that they're more likely to remember that. Along with that is using a one word direction. So the thing with ADHD kids is that they normally know what they need to do and they just get distracted by other things and so then they forget to do it. So the one word reminders can be helpful because they skip that feeling that the child is stupid or that they're getting lectured by you one more time. Um, plus it's also easier for them to focus and remember a one word direction than it is to give a longer direction. So instead of saying something like, remember you need to hang your jacket in the closet, not leave it on the floor, just simply point and say, jacket. Um, oftentimes that's enough for the child to remember, oh yeah, I'm supposed to hang my jacket up and they will just do it. The other thing with homework and giving directions is if you're having them work on things that are a larger activity, is to help them divide it into chunks. So these big tasks can be very overwhelming for ADHD kids. And so teaching them strategies to break things down into manageable parts can be really helpful and really useful for them. The other thing that you wanna do with ADHD kids is really try to keep them as active as possible. So exploring what they find interesting and stimulating and giving them off time structure through activities is going to be very useful and will foster success for them. And since ADHD medications are often not effective in the evening, finding things that they are passionate about and where they can be successful in the afternoons and evenings can be really good for their self esteem as well. So especially activities that are helpful for self-control, such as martial arts and yoga, where there's a focus on active control, can be very helpful for ADHD kids. Being active in team sports is one of those things where you have to kind of know the child and whether or not that's going to be successful for them with their ADHD. There are some ADHD kids who really like team sports and do well focusing on teams when they're active and feel successful at it. However, there are a lot of ADHD kids that get frustrated with competitive sports um, because of the rules that have to be followed, the expectations of coaches and teammates, and the expectations about being organized and on time. So, some, act, some of the sports such as baseball and softball can be especially difficult for ADHD kids because they need to have a lot of downtime where they're waiting. So know the child and know what kind of sports and activities are going to be most successful for them given the type of ADHD they have and how significant it is. Um, other activities that are really good for kids with ADHD are things like games that encourage focus. So these are strategy games, like memory games, the game Spot It, uh, a lot of ADHD kids really like that one because it's fast paced and it also encourages them to look and focus. Things like puzzles, Legos, teaching them chess or checkers can be really useful. <clears throat> and then things like Connect Four, Jenga are also games where you have that um, strategy and focus. So the one thing with all that is try to avoid criticizing them when you're playing those games and instead work with them to teach strategies to succeed at the game. And that's one way to help them kind of teaching to break down and strategize things and taking things in chunks and how to succeed at being able to do that. Some active control games, if the child is more active and you feel like they would be more successful with these type of games, things like a beanbag toss, playing catch and balance games really do help increase their ability to slow down and focus while still being active. 
So with ADHD kids, you really also want to work alongside them a lot of times to help them stick with it. And with that, you want to create a lot of positive energy to encourage them to work. So by working with them, you're partnering with them and giving them that extra support and staying active with them to help them be successful. And that way you can also kind of coach them and give them direction as they're going along with what they need to get done. The other thing that can be really useful is giving them activities at home that are meaningful ways for them to help out and stay active with you. So this can be things like helping you cook meals, reading a book to a younger sibling in the home, drawing puzzles, limiting TV and video games because it's hard for them to unplug from them. And so helping them find other things that are more active and engaging for them. So energize and encourage them. Help create fun ways to get things done and encourage the little successes that they have. Another thing that's really useful for kids with ADHD is having positive touch. And when I'm talking about positive touch, I'm talking about some good ways to give gentle reminders, encourage, soothe, and promote fun. ADHD kids, because they are craving stimulation, they will often respond well to this type of physical stimulation. So touch is a great way to connect to them and also give them those reminders and encouragement. So some of the things that you can do are rubbing their hands with lotion, having them put um, their forehead on their hand as a pressure point. And I believe that's one of the other handouts I have for you talking about the pressure point that's on the forehead that if you press into it provides some relaxation. The other things that can be soothing for them are things like putting a hand on their shoulder as a physical reminder, giving them high five and fist bumps when they're doing a good job, having a special handshake for them, which can also be really lovely for them to have that special handshake where they have to remember a sequence of the handshake. Um, so again, it's another way that's a focused active activity. A lot of ADHD kids love to dance, and so that's another kind of physical activity that you can do with them that will create that positive and nurturing touch with them in a safe way. Uh, kids with ADHD also often have difficulties settling down to sleep, and so a lot of times they will need more sensory stimulation to sleep. The difficulty with that is the sensory stimulation has to be stimulating, but it also has to be soothing and calming in the same, at the same time. Um, so that's where that piece with rubbing the feet with hands and lotion can be a good way to help them relax. Having soothing smells. Um, lavender is probably the one that's most well known to have a soothing effect on individuals. Um, so diffusing that or spraying some lavender in the room or on their pillows can be helpful. Listening to nature sounds or music is another thing that can be stimulating and calming at the same time. Reading books to them, and even for older kids, if you sit down and read a chapter book with them at bedtime, that can be useful. Yoga poses that help calm the body can be really helpful. Um, things like warm milk as a sensory internally for kids. And then relaxation scripts to read and practice before bedtime. So with that, I did also give you a handout on progressive muscle relaxation for kids. And what progressive muscle relaxation is, is basically tensing up your muscles, holding them for a certain period of time, and then releasing them. And in my experience, I found that ADHD kids really like that type of relaxation script because it's active and calming at the same time. So they're activating their muscles in a very strong, active way and then relaxing them. And so they're getting that body stimulation and then they're also getting the release. So there is a script that I gave you that will walk you through how to do a progressive muscle relaxation with kids. 
the other two relaxation scripts that I gave you, one is for younger children, and then the other one is for more teens and adults. Um, and with both of these, they're more of a guided meditation. So one of them is the anchor meditation, which talks about feeling like there's an anchor pulling you down and steadying you and grounding you. And the other one is a meditation about a strong tree and being able to feel your roots down in the ground and feeling grounded. And that's one thing that ADHD kids need frequent reminders for is to feel grounded, to feel strong, to feel steady. And so being able to use those in the evening as kind of re gentle reminders as they're going to sleep is a lovely way to end the day. And it can also be a lovely way to start the day as well. Along with that is a handout on mindfulness exercises. And those are all exercises basically to help with focused attention. And so those are things that can be practiced in the evening, again, before bed, or they can also be practiced in the morning to get them ready for activities that they have to focus their mind on. So those are some of the things that you can do at home. So some things for interacting with the schools. First of all, kind of looking at what is the foster parent role as far as supporting a foster child who has ADHD. The first thing is to share with teachers on a need to know basis um, what the child's diagnosis is, what medications they are on, and also helping the teacher understand what is novel, interesting, and stimulating for this child. And so by doing that, it's starting a conversation to encourage a successful environment for that teacher by being honest and upfront about what the student needs and also finding ways that might help that teacher teach in a way that's going to speak to that child in a more active and stimulating way. Um, and on the flip side of that, ask the teacher for suggestions. Teachers have many good ideas from other students that they've worked with about what is successful. And as they are working with the foster child, they may come up with some ideas that you could try at home as well that might be useful. Um, another thing that is often helpful for kids with ADHD is them having online textbooks because then they can't lose the textbook. And that way they also have access to the books at all times. So if they forget the book at school, if they forget it at home, they always have that textbook available to them. The other thing is asking if there is an auditory textbook. Um, so that way they can listen to the textbook and read along, which gives them that auditory and the visual stimulation at the same time. The other thing is to get creative with technology. So this can be things like taking a photo of the board at school and their homework on their phone to help them remember. I've also had some teachers who have allowed the kids to take a snapshot of their homework after they finished it. That way they don't forget to bring the homework. And if they do forget to bring the homework, they will have an actual picture of the homework that they completed that they can oftentimes forward to the teacher's email account. And that way they don't constantly lose the homework or lose it in transit between school and home. Um, the snapshots also allow them to not have to rush through things and make so many mistakes. So you really want to empower and, and strategize with kids with their homework. So one thing that can be really helpful is empowering them to figure out what works for them. So asking them questions about do they want to work on the hard stuff first or get the easy stuff out of the way. And then have them experiment to figure out what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And then the other piece of that is to really advocate for your child. So if it's taking them a long time to complete the work despite their best efforts, then talk to the teacher about adjusting their work. And a lot of times what helps is to start out 
asking the teacher on average how long it should take for the child to complete their work each night. And if your child is having to go way beyond what is the average to get the work completed, letting the teacher know and asking if they can either do every other problem or if it's okay for you to send a note saying what work they were able to complete. Um, and so those can be things that can be helpful as well. Some other little things that you can do is keeping extra supplies at home. So having a stash of pencils, notebooks, an extra calculator. So in case they do forget to bring things home that they need, they'll still have some of those things at home to be able to do that. Color coding notebooks and folders for their assignments is a great way to give them visual cues and help them keep track of things. And then one other thing is that it's really important with kids with ADHD that you're encouraging their effort, not their outcome. So have them focus on doing their personal best rather than worrying about what other people are going to think of them. So ADHD kids may not always get the gold star or the A plus from the teacher. And it's our job to let them know that's what, what is most important to us is that they're doing their personal best and that they should be proud of the fact that they are doing the best that they can do given the circumstance. And then the last thing as far as the educational piece is that if you feel that your foster child isn't getting their needs met, then you want to talk to the school and the foster care worker about whether or not the child should be evaluated for a special education plan. So there are special education options for ADHD kids such as 504 plans and IEP plans that can help ADHD students who are struggling and advocating for them as far as getting those services can be important as well. So in conclusion, thank you very much for your participation and listening to this webinar. I hope that it was useful for you and have a good rest of your day. Minnesota Department of Human Services, thank you. Minnesota Department of Human Services, mn.gov forward slash DHS.